Hi everyone and welcome to our module on tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is an ancient disease. They've found evidence of it in mummies and if you read history books tuberculosis had a great effect on civilization prior to the antibiotic era because it used to affect a lot of people especially in crowded places like cities and there are even many famous people over the centuries who've died from tuberculosis. Its old name is consumption because people who got sick from tuberculosis would lose weight so therefore it was called consumption and it gets its name because a tubercle is a round nodule and in tuberculosis you have multiple round nodules. Tuberculosis is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis and this bug is an obligate anaerobe so it prefers to live in the lungs and in particular reactivation disease prefers the upper lobes of the lung because as we talk about in other pulmonary modules the upper lobes of the lung have a very high V to Q ratio. This means that there's lots of extra ventilation and lots of extra oxygen around in the upper lobes and the tuberculosis bugs like this. These bugs are also facultative intracellular pathogens. What that means is they can live inside other cells when they need to, and in particular, they like to infect macrophages and grow inside macrophages. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Tuberculosis is very difficult to culture. Most of the traditional media used for other bacteria don't work, so you have to use special media. The one that most labs use is called Lowenstein Jensen Agar, or LJ Media for short. Now even when you use this to grow tuberculosis, it still takes a long time. It can take one to eight weeks to determine whether tuberculosis is present in a sputum sample, for example. Another thing to know about TB is it doesn't stain well with the gram stain. And the reason it doesn't stain well is because it has a structure called mycolytic acids in the cell wall. And it's easy to remember this because this is what makes it a mycobacterium. It's the presence of these mycolytic acids. There's also some fatty acids and complex lipids in the cell wall that keep it from staining well with the gram stain. So because those other stains don't work very well, we have to do a special technique called acid fast staining to identify tuberculosis. And the key point here is that the cell walls are impermeable to many dyes, but they will stain with very concentrated dyes plus some heat. And these dyes are lipid soluble, they contain compounds called phenols, and this helps them get inside those mycolytic cell walls of the bacteria. Once you stain a sample, you rinse the plate with something called an acid decolorizer, and this is why it's called an acid fast stain. Tuberculosis will resist decolorization with those acid solvents, and this is how you can identify them. And there are some other bacteria like Nocardia that also do this. There are a couple of key virulence factors for tuberculosis that you should be aware about, especially for step one, because they like to ask you about the mechanisms by which the bacteria survives and causes harm. So the first one is called triolose to mycolate, but everyone just calls it cord factor. And this is a molecule that helps the mycobacteria evade the immune response. In studies in the laboratory, it's been shown that cord factor can cause granuloma formation. It's also been shown in animal models to trigger cytokine release. And virulent strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis tend to have cord factor. Another important virulence factor are called sulfatides. These are glycolipids that are on the surface of the mycobacteria. And in order for phagocytes to kill the mycobacteria, they need to fuse the phagosome and the lysosome inside the cell. But these sulfatides inhibit that process, and this allows the mycobacteria to survive inside of cells. And then finally, many mycobacteria have the enzyme catalase peroxidase, and this allows them to resist killing by host cell oxidative processes. Tuberculosis spreads through the air. If a patient with active TB coughs or sneezes, then they can pass on the bacteria when they get inhaled by an uninfected person. This can particularly be a problem in very crowded areas, especially if people have poor nutrition and they're underfed. They can have a weak immune system and they're very susceptible to infection with TB and it can spread rapidly. Once a person is exposed to TB, you should know that most people will not develop active disease. The body will either completely clear the bug or it will wall it off and it will become latent. We'll talk more about that in a minute. It's a very small proportion of patients who actually go on to develop active tuberculosis after exposure. So let's talk about the potential consequences of exposure. So as I said before, some people will completely clear the bacteria from their body entirely. A small proportion will develop primary tuberculosis, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's mostly a lung infection. And then many people will have the infection contained by the body where it will be walled off, but it can become activated later if they get sick. Now some of those primary tuberculosis patients will have the infection resolve, and they usually then enter a latent phase that can reactivate later. Once the bacteria is in the latent form, it can reactivate later in life, sometimes even decades later when the person becomes immunocompromised. 
And then finally, either primary TB or reactivation TB can go on to develop a systemic, very serious illness called miliary TB, which is very rare in the modern era, but used to happen before antibiotics. And we're going to talk about all these different phases of the infection in the next few slides, and then we'll come back to this slide to review it again. So remember that most people who get a primary exposure to TB do not get sick. They either completely clear the infection or it's walled off and they enter a latent phase. It's very rare to get sick from your primary exposure to TB. When this does happen, it's usually a disease of childhood or chemo patients who have an ineffective immune response. And they will develop a syndrome that's gradual in onset over a few weeks. They'll have fever and cough. They can have pleuritic chest pain because the lungs are inflamed. And when they take in a deep breath, they stretch the pleura and that causes is pain and they can also have symptoms like fatigue and arthralgias. So what's going on at a pathophysiologic level when people get infected with primary TB? Well the first thing that happens is the bug goes inside macrophages. It gets phagocytosed and then it begins to proliferate inside the macrophage and then eventually it will kill the macrophage and when the macrophage dies it will spill tuberculosis all over the lungs to go and infect other cells. After a few weeks of this, the cell-mediated immune system will kick in, and it's very high yield to remember that the response to TB is a cell-mediated immune response. Antibodies and complement don't play a major role here. It's a Th1 response with activation of CD4-positive T cells and secretion of interferon gamma, and eventually activated macrophages and cytotoxic T lymphocytes will be called in to control the infection. So the type of inflammation that occurs in tuberculosis is called granulomatous inflammation and granulomatous inflammation leads to granulomas. And there are a couple of key things that you need to remember about granulomatous inflammation, especially for step one. The first is that this type of inflammation can lead to either caseating or non-caseating necrosis. This is a description of the gross specimens of tissue that has granulomatous inflammation. These tissues can either be caseating, which means they have a cheese-like substance that you can see in the inflamed tissue, or they can be non-caseating. Caseating granulomatous inflammation is what happens in tuberculosis. Non-caseating granulomatous inflammation is what happens in sarcoid. Another very high yield thing to remember about granulomatous inflammation is that it involves macrophages. They get called in by the immune system and they transform into cells called epithelioid cells, which are large cells that look like epithelial cells, hence their name. And they also transform into giant cells. And this is a picture of a giant cell right here. It's one of the hallmarks of granulomatous inflammation and it kind of looks like a horseshoe. That's how people describe it. Another important thing about granulomatous inflammation is that fibroblasts are involved. They get activated and they lay down collagen. And then finally, you should know that granulomatous inflammation is an example of T-cell mediated delayed type hypersensitivity reactions or a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And just remember that the type 4 hypersensitivity reactions are the ones that involve cell mediated immunities. All the other hypersensitivity types like 1, 2, and 3 involve antibodies and complement and things like that. Now let's talk about the chest x-ray and tuberculosis. So first of all, you should know that the chest x-ray is often normal, so there isn't necessarily a finding in tuberculosis. However, a classic finding, and one that's very high yield for you to know about on your boards, is hilar lymphadenopathy. If you look at this x-ray on the right, I'm circling the hilar lymph nodes in this patient, and they're enlarged, and they're white, and this is what you see in patients who have hilar lymphadenopathy. The hilum is where the bronchi enter the lungs, and so hilar lymphadenopathy is lymphadenopathy in this area, and it occurs in tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. It's classic for both of those conditions. It's been reported as early as one week after someone gets infected with tuberculosis, and it usually resolves slowly over months to years once the infection's been treated. Another feature of tuberculosis infection that's high yield to know about is something called a GON foci. So if you look at this lung specimen in the bottom right over here, you'll see this yellowish thing in the periphery right here. I'm also circling it in the top picture here. And this is called a GON foci. And this is the result of granuloma formation that is subpleural, usually in the mid to lower lungs. Now if you have one of these GON foci plus one of those hilar lymph nodes, that's called a GON complex, and that's highly suggestive of tuberculosis. And sometimes you will even see a calcified GON complex, and once it becomes fully calcified, it's called a Ranke complex. And these are all the results of primary exposure to tuberculosis. Somebody who has a GON complex is usually someone who's been exposed to tuberculosis and has entered the latent phase. They can reactivate later. 
Usually once they go on to develop a Ranke complex, they now have full calcification and they're less likely to reactivate. But in either case, these complex formations are the result of primary exposure to tuberculosis. So what happens when primary tuberculosis infection resolves? Well, most patients, about 90%, will control the infection and the disease will heal, leaving some fibrosis. Now, sometimes it completely clears, but often it enters a latent phase where it's walled off. So there's no active infection, but the patient could get sick later. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. When this happens, immunity develops and a test called the PPD, which we'll talk about in a few slides, will be positive. Rarely, a small minority of patients go on to have expanded illness, and when you have expanded illness beyond the lungs, this is called miliary dissemination, and this occurs most commonly in patients who have other reasons to be immune compromised, like HIV patients or patients with chronic kidney disease or diabetes. So miliary tuberculosis gets its name from the classic appearance on chest x-ray, and this is an example of it here in the bottom right-hand corner. You see these small white lines in both lung fields that look like millet seeds, and that's why it's called miliary TB. And this represents hematogenous spread of the tuberculosis mycobacteria. Miliary TB can occur from progressive primary infection, or it can occur from reactivation. And not only are both lung fields involved, like in this example, in the chest x-ray, nearly any organ system can be involved. The TB infection can spread to bones and liver. It can go to the central nervous system and cause meningitis. It can go to the heart and cause pericarditis, and it can go to the skin. Miliary TB is very rare in the modern era, but decades ago, when there weren't good antibiotic therapy for TB, this was much more common, and doctors spent a lot of time diagnosing miliary TB that had spread to various organ systems. A couple of specific places the miliary TB can go to that you should know about are first of all POTS disease. So this is spread of tuberculosis to the spine causing osteomyelitis. And patients with POTS disease have back pain and fever and night sweats and weight loss. And TB can also spread to the pericardium and it can cause pericarditis or constrictive pericarditis. So now let's talk about reactivation TB. So this occurs in a patient who has had their primary exposure resolve. Maybe it left behind one of those gone complexes, or maybe they've just got the latent bug hiding somewhere in their body, and then it reactivates. And this usually happens in someone who has some type of immunocompromise. So they'll develop cough or weight loss or fatigue. They can get fever and night sweats. They often have chest pain, especially pleuritic chest pain. And it's high yield to know that reactivation TB classically causes cavitation. So there is caseous and liquefactive necrosis causing a cavity to form, usually in the lungs. Because the cavity forms in the lungs, it can cause hemoptysis. The cavity can erode into the pulmonary vasculature. And the chest x-ray classically shows an upper lobe lesion. And this is an example of an upper lobe lesion on the right, a cavitary lesion of TB. And remember I said that TB likes the upper lobes of the lung because that's where that VQ ratio is highest, so there's a lot of extra oxygen around for the bug to use. So a lot of people are exposed to TB but don't know it, and they have latent infection. And as long as their immune system is normal, they'll be fine for their entire lives and never have a problem. But if immune compromise develops, they can get reactivation tuberculosis. So this is going to happen to people when they develop HIV infection, for example. It can happen to people who are put on certain drugs, especially drugs that are TNF-alpha inhibitors. These are used for some autoimmune diseases, and these are drugs like etanercept and infliximab. Also, sometimes patients who develop diabetes. And when you start certain drugs, you often test people for latent tuberculosis so that you don't give them a reactivation infection. One complication of reactivation cavitary TB that you should know about is an aspergilloma. This is a fungus ball. It's caused by the fungus Aspergillus fumigatus. This is a non-invasive form of aspergillosis, and it likes to grow in preformed cavities. So pulmonary TB is the most common association. It's often asymptomatic, and it's sometimes picked up when people do follow-up chest x-rays on patients who've had TB. If the fungus ball gets big enough, it can erode into the vasculature and cause hemoptysis. Usually diagnose it by imaging plus a sputum culture that shows aspergillus. And if the aspergilloma is small, sometimes they're just observed. If they're large, they usually need surgery. And I mentioned aspergillosis up here in the top right corner just to help clarify this bug. It's kind of confusing it because it can cause a couple of different infections. So patients can have an allergic reaction to aspergillus, and that's called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Patients who are severely immunocompromised, especially bone marrow transplant patients, can get invasive aspergillus. And this is where their lungs can get full of fungus, and this can be life-threatening. And an aspergilloma is this fungus ball that likes to form in people who already have a cavity in their lungs, like people who've had TB.
So now let's go back to our summary slide of what can happen after tuberculosis exposure. So remember, most people don't get sick from exposure. They either clear the infection or they enter the latent phase. But a small minority of people develop primary tuberculosis. That can progress to miliary TB or it can resolve and go back into the latent phase. And then people who are in the latent phase can sometimes reactivate. And there is a chance that that reactivation tuberculosis can go on to the miliary form. Let's talk about how you diagnose active tuberculosis. So let's suppose someone comes in with an insidious onset of fever, cough, and hemoptysis, and you think they might have TB. The usual method for diagnosis is to send three sputum samples. Remember I said it's hard to culture, so you want more than one sample. They're usually taken about eight hours apart, and they can be either a spontaneous sample or sometimes we induce them. And the way you induce a sputum sample is you have the patient inhale a little bit of aerosolized saline by nebulizer, and this makes them cough up some phlegm. And then you send it for that acid fast smear and then also for a culture. But remember, the culture is going to take a few weeks to come back because the bug is very slow growing. It's not necessary to hospitalize someone just because you suspect tuberculosis. If they're well enough to go home, you can work them up as an outpatient. You tell them to remain at home and avoid visitors and wear a mask until you've excluded TB. If you decide to hospitalize someone because they're very sick, you need to put them on something called respiratory isolation. So there are sick patients in the hospital. Some of them may even be immunocompromised, and you can't expose them to a patient who potentially has TB. So the TB patient has to go in a private room with negative air pressure, and people who enter must wear a respirator with a tight seal over the nose and mouth. It's actually quite cumbersome to hospitalize someone who you're trying to rule out for TB because of all these precautions you have to take. So that's how you diagnose active TB in someone who's coughing and very sick. But what if you have someone who's completely well and you're worried that they have latent TB? It's very important to identify these individuals if you want to control the spread of infection. And the way you do it is with tuberculin skin testing. So you inject a very small amount of fluid, just about a tenth of a milliliter, subcutaneously under the skin. You make a little bubble under the skin. And the material you inject is called purified protein derivative, or PPD. And it's a substance that creates a reaction in people who have been exposed to TB before. You wait 48 hours and then you measure the diameter of induration, which is hardening of the skin around the site that you injected. And a key point here that sometimes comes up on tests is you measure the amount of induration, not erythema. So if you're looking at the arm of a patient who was injected with a PPD two days ago, you'll see a small hardened area like this, and it'll be surrounded by a little red area on the outside. What you want to do to determine whether the PPD test is positive or negative is measure the diameter of this area right here. You do not measure the diameter of the erythema on the outside. And that's a classic trick question, especially on internal medicine boards. Once you measure the diameter of induration at 48 hours after placing a PPD test, you use a table like the one I've drawn on the screen here to determine whether the test is positive or negative. In patients who are healthy and over four years old with a low chance of having TB, you only call it a positive test if the diameter of induration is greater than 15 millimeters. In patients who are high risk, we use a lower threshold and we call it positive if it's over 10 millimeters. And high risk individuals are people with silicosis or kidney disease or diabetes, IV drug users, homeless people, prison employees, and there are some other groups that we sometimes call high risk. If the patient has HIV or they're immunocompromised, it's very difficult for them to mount an immune response to the PPD test. So in these people, we call it positive if it's greater than 5 millimeters. And then if it's under 5 millimeters, no matter who you are, it's always negative. So based on a table like this, you call it positive or negative. And if it's a positive test, we say that that person has latent tuberculosis. Now, in reality, this test tells us they've been exposed to tuberculosis and that they have memory in their immune system to it. We don't know whether it's latent or whether they completely cleared it. But either way, we're going to treat them the same way. We're going to assume that they have latent infection inside their body. One thing that's very high yield to know about PPD testing is that there are false negatives. So there are people who will have a negative PPD. They won't show significant induration at 48 hours, but they still have latent infection. These are people who can't mount an appropriate immune response to the PPD that you inject into their skin. So these are going to be people on immunosuppressive drugs like steroids or TNF-alpha inhibitors. There'll be people who are immunocompromised, like HIV patients and patients with CKD and malnutrition. And it also happens in people who have diseased lymph systems. So people who have sarcoidosis and some lymphomas and leukemias can't mount the normal response to the PPD injection.
There's also a false positive that can sometimes occur in patients who've received a vaccine for tuberculosis called the BCG vaccine. This vaccine is a live strain of Mycobacterium bovis, and it's not that effective, so it's not used that widely. It's more effective in patients who've had no TB exposure, so it's about 80% effective in children, less effective in adults because many of these adults have had some exposure to TB already. It's used in children in areas with a high prevalence of tuberculosis. It's not used in the United States, but it's used in other countries and it will create a false positive PPD test. There is a treatment that's offered to people with a positive PPD under the assumption that they have latent tuberculosis. So most patients with latent TB will not develop disease, but there is a small proportion that may reactivate. And if you treat them prophylactically, you lower the risk. And there are a couple of regimens to treat patients with a positive PPD, but one of the very common ones is isoniazid or INH for nine months. After you treat people like this, you never want to do another PPD because it's always going to be positive for the rest of their life, so the test is not helpful anymore. If you're worried whether they have tuberculosis, you have to do a chest x-ray and other workup for active disease. So the last topic I'll discuss in this module is how to treat active tuberculosis. And you should know that it's very difficult to treat active tuberculosis with just one drug. These mycobacteria have resistance to many different drugs, so you need to use a multi-drug regimen, usually a three or four drug regimen. A typical regimen usually includes isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and sometimes even streptomycin. Sometimes people are asked to undergo direct observation therapy, so this is a public health issue. If you prescribe someone drugs for tuberculosis and they miss dosages or they're non-compliant, then drug-resistant bacteria called multi-drug resistant tuberculosis can develop, and this can be a threat to the community health. So in some places they require patients to come in for observed therapy so they make sure that they don't miss dosages. So now let's talk about the tuberculosis drugs one at a time. And the first drug we'll discuss is isoniazid. Many people call it INH for short. And this drug blocks the synthesis of mycolic acids. And recall that those mycolic acids are key components of the cell membrane in tuberculosis. They're also what give the bacteria its acid fastness. So the bacteria lose their acid fastness after treatment with isoniazid. You should also know that there is an enzyme inside the tuberculosis bacteria called CATG encoded catalase peroxidase, and it converts INH to its active form. So over time, the bugs can develop mutations of this that lead to INH resistance, and this is part of the reason why monotherapy is not used, because it does produce resistance through mechanisms related to this enzyme here. Isoniazid has a couple important side effects you should know about. The first one is that it can cause neurotoxicity. It can cause neuropathy, so patients can get numbness in their extremities. They can get ataxia, which would cause them to have loss of balance and falls, and they can have paresthesias. One of the reasons it causes these neurotoxic effects is that it competes with vitamin B6 as a cofactor in neurotransmitter synthesis. So for this reason, vitamin B6 is co-administered with the drug to limit the neurotoxicity. INH can also cause hepatotoxicity, so patients taking this drug have to have their LFTs monitored. The mechanism of this is not clear, but it's probably related to metabolites of INH. And then finally, it's one of the drugs that can cause a drug-induced lupus-like syndrome. Next drug we'll talk about for tuberculosis is rifampin, and this drug inhibits bacterial DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So by inhibiting this enzyme, it blocks RNA synthesis in the tuberculosis bugs. The main side effects of rifampin are liver and GI, so it can increase the LFTs just like INH, and it can cause GI upset like nausea and cramps and diarrhea. One thing that's very high yield to know about this, especially for your boards, is that it results in a red-orange discoloration of fluids. Now this is not dangerous, but this is something patients are going to notice. Their urine, their saliva, their sweat and their tears, it's all going to turn red-orange. If you even do a spinal tap, you can see that their CSF is red or orange. And like I said, this is something patients notice and something that often comes up in board questions. And then rifampin is not just used for tuberculosis, it's also used for a couple other things you should know about. It's given to treat leprosy. If there's a meningitis outbreak, for example, in a college dorm, it can be given for prophylaxis. And then it's very uncommon for children in the United States to get haemophilus influenza infection because of vaccines. But if children haven't been vaccinated, they can develop epiglottitis or pneumonia or meningitis from haemophilus influenza. And then rifampin can be used to prevent an outbreak in close contacts of kids who are sick. Next TB drug is pyrazinamide. Its mechanism of action is unknown, but it is converted to pyrazinoic acid, or PZA, and it may be more active in the acidic environment inside macrophages. That's thought to be a component of how it works. 
important side effects of this drug are that it's hepatotoxic, so it can raise the LFTs, and then it competes with uric acid for excretion in the kidneys, so when pyrazinamide gets excreted, uric acid doesn't get excreted, and the levels can rise. This can cause hyperuricemia and potentially gout exacerbations. Next drug we'll talk about is ethambutol. So this inhibits an enzyme called arabinosyl transferase, which the mycobacteria use to create their cell walls. This enzyme helps polymerize arabinose to make the cell walls. So by blocking that, you can kill the bugs. And a key side effect of ethambutol to know about is optic neuropathy. So patients who take this drug can develop color blindness. They can have difficulty discriminating between red and green hues. Sometimes they lose their visual acuity. And this is usually reversible when you stop the drug. And then the last drug I'll talk about is streptomycin. So this was the first drug ever developed for tuberculosis in the 1940s. It's the first aminoglycoside that was ever developed. It's a very old aminoglycoside drug. And it inhibits the bacterial 30S ribosomal subunit, and this prevents protein synthesis. The problem is there is a tremendous amount of resistance to this drug. Mutations of genes for ribosomal proteins develop, and then it doesn't work anymore. And for this reason, streptomycin is rarely used anymore. So we've covered a lot in this module, and tuberculosis is very high yield, especially for step one. So let me leave you with some key points that you don't want to forget. Remember that mycolytic acid makes up the cell walls, and this is what makes TB acid fast. Remember that it infects macrophages and becomes intracellular. Remember that it's a cell-mediated immune response. It's a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction, a type 4 reaction. Remember that primary exposure leads to hilar lymphadenopathy and the GON complex. Remember that reactivation likes to occur in the upper lobes, especially in immunosuppressed patients. You diagnose a latent infection with a PPD test. You treat the latent disease with INH, and you treat the active disease with a multidrug regimen. And that concludes our module on tuberculosis.